spirits alive. Join your host, John Tobin, as he and his guest co-host bring you cutting-edge interviews and topics in the paranormal world. Founder of Glory Haunt Hounds, John's interest in the paranormal began after several out-of-body experiences as a child and escalated when he witnessed his first full-bodied apparition. John's love of history and preserving the haunt has fed his radio and speaking career, and now he shares his knowledge and experience with you to assist him in keeping the spirits alive. Now, here is your host of Keeping the Spirits Alive, John Tobin, on WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Welcome to Keeping the Spirits Alive here. It is Tuesday, April the 3rd, 2018. Thanks so much for being patient with me as I sort through life and get back on the air. It's been a few weeks since I've been on, so I appreciate your patience. But here we are with a brand new show. And I have a great guest for you this evening that I'm really excited to talk to. Uh, the guest tonight we'll be on in a few minutes is Daniel Kloss. And uh, Daniel is an author of a book called, um, I have it right here, Hinsdale House, an American Haunting, which he wrote back in 2016. Dan is also the oh, current owner of the Hinsdale House. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that and his restoration project, which he has been doing an absolutely fantastic job with. And uh, also, he's host of the uh, show Within These Walls, which is on the uh, Elizabeth Saint and Nick Groff's VD Pay-Per-View TV network. He's also been a longtime producer of uh, Behind the Shadows documentary film series, as well as many other things uh, that we will certainly get into and talk about over the hour. Very busy man and somebody that, uh, you know, in my busiest in the paranormal field about three or four years ago, uh, I don't even think I could keep up with Dan. Uh, I probably couldn't even chauffeur his golf cart if there was a paranormal golf cart on his uh, travels but uh lots of respect for what he's doing and uh, we'll certainly get into that tonight uh, a gentleman who certainly uh has a love for historical preservation which is near and dear to my heart so uh that means a lot to me to have daniel on tonight and uh really looking forward to talking to him uh before we get to that we're going to do a couple things on the air tonight uh, i'm going to do my regular segment a little bit that uh I like to call News of the Weird. We'll get to that in just a bit. But a couple of small announcements for you. Um, after a bit of a hiatus, um, I didn't do – I don't think I did any events in 2017. I probably did one. I don't remember. Oh, I did sort of one, but I, not really. Um, got a couple things coming up this year, and I'm very excited about – actually, uh, four things I can talk about. Three I can actually talk about, and the other one hasn't been announced yet by – the promoter, so I will I will wait uh, until the next show to announce that. But coming up real soon, in just a few weeks, on April 23rd to be exact, I will be hosting this month's meetup at the I-84 Diner in Fishkill, New York, which is uh, an event that's hosted monthly by the Ghost Magnets with a Twist out here in New York. Um, and I am going to be the, the, the monthly meetup host. And I'm planning something a little bit different for that. Um, something that I haven't done in any of the other events that I've done in the past. So if you're in the Fishkill, New York, which is uh, the Newburgh, um, that area sort of uh, south, I guess south central, about an hour, about 40 minutes from the city or so, 45 minutes from the city. If you're in that area on April 23rd, join us for dinner at the I-84 Diner. I believe the whole meetup starts around 7 o'clock, 6.30, 7, somewhere around there. They always have a great turnout, too. Um, some of the other folks that have hosted that meetup last month, it was uh, Rosalind Bowne and Mike Lewis, who were my guests last month on the show. Um, John Zappis has been down there and hosted it. Um, um, just many great Brian Cano. Many great people from the paranormal world have been down there and hosted the meetup. They asked me to do it a, a few years ago, and I wasn't really doing anything at the time. Um, so uh, I just wasn't doing any events and kind of stepped as listeners of the show. No, I stepped out, out of the the realm for quite a while. Um, but I told him, you know, it's been a long time, so I'd be happy to do that. So that's coming up April 23rd again, the Fishkill Diner. There's uh, no tickets or anything like that. It's a totally free event. Of course, uh, you're encouraged to order food from the Delicious Diner, which is a, a great place. Um, and uh, I believe you just go on Facebook, Ghost Magnets with a Twist, just let them know you're going so they make sure they save you a seat. And that's, uh, that's all you got to do there. Coming up, uh, I have another event also in July, which I'll be announcing – um, the next show, it's an official appearance, but uh, like I said, the, the promoters haven't announced it yet, so I will wait. Um, coming up September, ways off yet, but September 14th and 15th, I'll be appearing at the 
the Hunting the Haunted Paracon, which is in Londonderry, New Hampshire. I believe my guest tonight, Daniel Kloss, is also speaking at said Paracon. So that'll be another opportunity for me to catch up with Daniel at that time and find out how crazy his summer was, which I'm sure we'll we'll hear a little bit about tonight. Uh, so September 14th and 15th, you can get your tickets at huntingthehaunted.com and online at uh, Facebook. There are a lot of links for that. Eric Knapp, our good friend, is putting that on. Um, and then in October... I believe October 12th and 13th, I am the Master of Ceremonies for the AuthorCon and ScreenFest, which is also here in New York. I believe it's in Oneonta, New York, at the Holiday Inn Express. So uh, it's going to be a busier year for me. Uh, I'm nowhere near as busy as a lot of my friends, including Daniel, but I have been very busy before. So to do three or four things during the summer is a big deal for me. It's been quite a few years since I've done that. So I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you out there as I can at some of these great events. If you need any more information or details on any of these great events, just go to uh, to Facebook and look up uh, ScreenFest and AuthorCon, look up the Ghost Magnus with a Twist meetup, and look up the Hunting the Haunted uh, Paracon uh, for more details. And I'm going to bring Daniel on here in just a minute. But before we do that, I would like to give you a little segment that I like to call News of the Weird. News of the Weird. Weird. And if I ever decide not to do News of the Weird anymore, I'm going to still play that because I just like to hear Todd say News of the Weird over and over again. It's great. So got a couple of stories for you today that caught my eye that you will not see in the mainstream news uh, that I wanted to share with you this week. First of all, uh, the one comes to us here from Romania, uh, home of Transylvania, home of Dracula, Romania. This is Constantine Raleu, 63. He appealed unsuccessfully to a court in Balrod, Romania in March to overturn a death certificate that his wife had obtained after not hearing from him in more than a decade. According to The Guardian, Relu left Romania for Turkey in 1992 to look for employment, but he neglected to keep in touch with his family. So in 2003, Relu's wife, believing he had died in an earthquake in Turkey, argued in court for a death certificate, which didn't come to light until Relu was deported back to Romania because of expired papers in Turkey. Upon his arrival, immigration officers explained to Relu that he had died in 2003. Hmm... His appeal, however, failed as the court, the court maintained he was too late and the ruling is final, leaving Rulu in an odd state of limbo. I'm officially dead, although I'm alive, Relu to Romanian media outlets. I have no income, and because I'm listed dead, I can't do anything. Hmm. Now, that's a predicament that uh, I wonder what it would be like to be in. Now, there are days that I wish I was dead, and there are certainly days that I wish that people thought I was dead, but not really. I'm just a little, it's a little sad there, but... What do you do in that situation? Everyone's telling you you're dead. I mean, I don't know. That's that's a tough one to come back from. But to find out what Daniel would do in that situation. Anyway, the next one is uh actually comes to us. It's a paranormal story. Uh, it is from the List Howell Paranormal Society in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, a group that I'm not particularly familiar with. But they were surprised when police arrived. Uh, the uh, the member was surprised when police arrived at his door on March 13th, just a few weeks ago, inquiring about a small black box with a red wire protruding from it that he'd left at Mackenzie Hall in Windsor. The Windsor Police Explosives Disposal Unit was called to the hall to investigate the box, but determined it was safe and not explosive. Society members had used the box on March 9th at the historic building to sweep for spirits. Jen Parker, assistant director for the society, called the box of all things, an EMF detector, and said each member of the team was using one while looking for ghosts. The society's spokesman also told the CBC there were strong signs of paranormal activity at the hall, especially in the old jail dressing room and basement, uh, and also no signs of a bomb were found anywhere on the premises. So uh, how about that? So just be careful, investigators out there. Don't leave your equipment behind. Some folks out there are not as familiar with what these devices are used for. And uh, you could have some unexpected visitors. So here's another interesting story in the things that make you go, hmm, department. So we have uh, experienced wait times in the emergency room. They're notoriously long. It's kind of like, kind of like visiting the DMV or, you know, some place where you just go and you make an appointment. You show up early. You're there on time. You're waiting for seemingly sometimes no apparent reason. Well, wait times in emergency rooms can be notoriously long. And Danny Kaczynski's experience was no different. On March 6th at the Villages Hospital in the Villages, Florida, the Lady Lake resident, 61, was at home earlier in the day when a neighbor called 911 to report Kaczynski was drunk and suicidal. 
According to WOFL-TV, first responders took him to the hospital where he waited for two hours to see a doctor before getting exasperated and stealing an ambulance to drive home. Kaczynski parked the ambulance in the driveway of the neighbor he thought had called the police about him, and when Lake County Sheriff's investigators tracked him down, they found Kaczynski curled up in the trunk of his own car in the garage. Kaczynski was put on a no-bond status because he is still on probation from a 2017 drunk driving charge. And the things that make you go home and you can't make this stuff up, department. Give me one more. Give me one more little story here before we bring on our guest. I had a couple to pick from here. Which one do I think is uh, is the best here? We got some from you know the weirdest stories always come from Florida, and I always say that. And and uh, it's either Florida or Texas. I always have the weirdest stories, and occasionally uh, occasionally Europe. But this one comes from Texas. Now that we mentioned uh, Texas, so uh, Anna Lisa Garza, who is a Star County District Judge in South Texas, she's well, she's running for the state of House seat in District Thirty One. Garza has received almost $90,000 in contributions to her campaign, campaign, but more than 50000 of that has been in a most unusual currency. Well, what currency, may you ask, is this $50,000 contribution in? Well, it's, of course, deer semen. Deer breeder Fred Gonzalez, treasurer of the Texas Deer Association, said breeders often donate semen straws, and I'm not sure why they're called straws, because, well, anyway, uh, instead of money, semen is a very common way for us to donate. Uh, one collection of a buck could lead to 60 straws sometimes. If you have a desirable animal, that is, it's a way to bring value without breaking the bank. A campaign finance report valued each straw donated at $1,000. Gonzalez told the Dallas Morning News that the semen donated for Garza's campaign went into a tank sold in one lot, the proceeds of all which will go to the campaign. Hmm. Well, I'm glad we don't do that for uh, with people, I guess is the best way to put it, because uh, there would be some unwanted donations for certain campaigns. As, uh, we'll leave it at that. and I won't touch that one, and I'm certainly not going anywhere near it with a straw, just for the record. Uh, so we'll leave that as that. But uh, anyway, enough of the news of the weird. And uh, I think it's time to bring on Daniel Kloss. Again, Daniel is the current owner of the Hinsdale House in Western New York and near the Buffalo area. He is uh, also the longtime film producer of Behind Behind the Shadows documentary film series, a host of Within These Walls on Nick Groff and Elizabeth Saint's VD pay-per-view TV network that does air every Saturday at 11 p.m. at www.vd.space. Um, you can also read Daniel's book, Hinsdale House, an American Haunting. It is available on Amazon and all fine booksellers. And Daniel also has some interesting takes on the paranormal, staying in touch with spirituality, which I'd like to talk to him about a little bit. And also uh, certainly a love for historical preservation and doing a fantastic job with the house itself. And we'll talk more about that. Without further ado, Daniel Kloss, welcome to Keeping the Spirits Alive. Hey, thanks for having me, John. I'm so glad to have you on. Um, somebody, it's funny because uh, last year we were um, at an event where we had a chance to talk a little bit. Um, and I, I swear that we had met years ago. But I couldn't pinpoint where or when. But we, I've both done so many things that uh, could have met in passing and and probably probably five times over and not remembered it for whatever reason. So I'm glad to finally have you on the show, and I'm glad that uh, we have an event we're doing together so we'll get to keep up a little bit, a little yeah. bit more. It's going to be great. I think there will be a few. Yeah, I'm sure there probably will be a few. Uh, and then I'm getting my feet back wet again. So that's, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that works out. So – Let's go back a little bit to um, tell the listeners, if you don't mind, you know, just because people are always interested in this. Where did you get your start in the uh, the paranormal world, and what first spiked your interest in all this crazy stuff? For me, it started when I was a young kid. You know, like because we had weird things happening in our house, and I was always interested in kind of figuring out why these strange things were happening. Um, my parents always sloughed it off as nothing, you know, like, but they knew, they even say to this day, they know, they knew that there was things, but they didn't want to scare us kids. Um, like, um, footsteps, uh, you, we had weird, uh, crayon drawings on the ceilings. My sister's stuffed animals would be moved in the house. Nothing malicious, you know, just like childlike type things, you know? And I remember I was, uh, sleeping over my friend's house a couple doors over my parents had uh, gone away and I went in the house to get my G.I. Joe guys and it sounded like I heard a little girl singing upstairs and we ran upstairs and there was nobody there but my sister stuffed animals were in the middle of the floor so it kind of got me going thinking about the paranormal and uh, when I turned 18 I had gone to Lilydale and I didn't really believe in psychics at that time but I was kind of exploring 
exploring that kind of side of it. My friend took me there, and I had sat down with a really great psychic by the name of Alan Bourne. And um, before before I even sat down at the table, she said, "You have two children, ch- child spirits living in your house, a little boy and a little girl." And I'm like, "Okay, all my questions are answered." She, I didn't even have to ask the question. And um, you know, I just kind of I did some research, found out the the little boy and the little girl from the deed, and looked up the family and found a death notice that they both died of cystic fibrosis. She said they were attached to something in the house, and I didn't really figure out what it was until later in life when I actually went back and purchased that house from my parents because they were they were moving. And um, I had never been up in the attic. And um, when, when I went up there, there were these dusty boards over in the back. And come to find out that these were paintings of a little boy and a little girl. And I felt like that that's what they were attached to. Hmm. Um, and we helped. I feel like, I feel like they're, they've moved on. I feel like we had them move on, and um, I still have the paintings to this day. I've since moved out of that house, but it's just kind of like a Scooby-Doo story, and that uh, <laughs> kind of got me going, you know? No, that's, um, that, that's a great story. I mean, uh, I, you know, when that stuff happens to you when you're at a young age and starts, uh, it really stays with you, and, and sometimes uh, it's, it's hard to, you know, it, it starts drawing you in, like, you know, that's kind of where you were meant to be. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, crazy how that happens. Following life's path, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let the listeners know how uh, when, when you first became aware of the Hinsdale House, and what was it that that piqued your interest in it? Uh, you know, prior pre, prior to you know even considering purchasing it. Well, um, I I have a team here in the Western New York area, the Greater Western New York Paranormal Society. Uh, me and the co-founder Cameron. Uh, you know, normally my duty was to book the book the places and make sure that our accommodations were ready. And he got he got the Hinsdale house and told us about it, but he didn't want us to do any research. And at that point, I really didn't know much about it. I didn't I didn't know about the exorcisms. I didn't know about anything. And uh, he basically just told us, he goes, come up to the house and I'll brief brief everybody up before we do our investigation. It was uh, like a private thing we were doing, and it was in the middle of December. And I know you've been there before, so driving up that 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 big dirt road all the way up that hill in the middle of December and then seeing this house in the middle of nowhere, you just, yeah. you just got a real creep factor, you know? Absolutely. And um, it, nothing really negative happened that night, but um, when we got in there and sat down, he had us watch the, the episode of A Haunting, uh, a, a Dark Forest, which is based on the story of the Hinsdale house. And um, I, I looked at him and I said, are you kidding me, dude? I go, you brought, brought us to a house where there was a failed exorcism and didn't think that would be a kind, kind of a good thing to uh, let us know about, you know. But, you know, it was a good night. We got some good evidence, and um, I had really wanted to l- know a little bit more about this. So I started researching it a little bit more. I got to know Mark and Corinne, uh, the teams that were um, involved with the house at the time. And uh, uh, it, it just uh, – I, I had a personal experience there. I had gone back a few times. And I had a personal experience in the house that I don't believe was related to um, anything that had to do with the Dandy family, which it's famous for. I right. mean, that's all we were investigating is the, the Dandy family claims. And I said to myself, this house is almost 200 years old. It's got to be. There's got to be more here than that. Mm. And I uh, started researching about the Misnick family that lived there and the McMahon O'Briens and looking up history. And it just became like a, kind of an infatuation to me. Um, and then when uh, it came to the point where it was going to be torn down, they had ripped all the ductwork out and the electrical, and I just felt like, oh, my God, this is such a travesty to have this thing gone. You know, they think it's going to be worth more money being able to sell the land without the house on it because nobody will live there. And they've tried to run it out so many times, and it keeps going back to the to the owners, you know, the, the, the owners that had purchased it back in the 1970s. So... Um, you know, I, Michelle Ball, who the, was the, one of the team members uh, at the time, got in contact with me, and she's like, Dan, you really need to buy this, blah, blah, blah. And she really pushed me, and she assured me that she would help me, and she, she has. And she's hmm. pulled true to her word because she lives close down there. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this if I live in Buffalo, and this is an hour and a half away. I, there's no way I can keep running down there, letting teams in, going back and forth, and my car is going to break down. What's gonna... But Michelle <laughs> and I, I've had uh, so much help, you know, so much great great help from teams and um, investigators and it's it's really a collaboration it's not just my place this is this is for everybody and everybody to come and research and everybody is so many teams have helped me learn new things you know I think and it's it's awesome 
I, I think your outlook is very fresh, and I'm going to talk more about uh, your outlook there and about the restoration project, and certainly a lot more about the Hinsdale House. We have a really short station break we need to take right now, Dan, and we'll be back in, in just a couple minutes here with uh, more of Daniel Kloss and Keeping the Spirits Alive. Please stay tuned. If you call other talk stations, all you get is... Hello, we're sorry, but no one is available to answer your call at this time. But at Let's Talk Radio, we're here for the best talk, news, and information 24 hours a day. Hear it here first or find out about the alien invasion tomorrow from someone else. Depend on us. Let's Talk Radio.net. In 2012, Keith Linder, after successfully obtaining a management position at a prestige healthcare company, decides the time is right for him and his girlfriend to move in together. That's putting things lightly. Weird things begin to happen within days of moving into the modern suburban home. The horrors they witnessed and desperately tried to fight off would end up putting them at the odds with members of the paranormal community and themselves. This gripping story told from the house occupant's point of view not only lists tales, but also includes pictures, video reenactments, commentary, and audio of the events being reported. Author Keith Linder does not ask you to believe him. He only asks you to listen. The Bothell Hell House by Keith Linder, now available on Amazon. The book, The Bothell Hell House, the author, Keith Linder. Order yours today on Amazon. Terry Lovelace is a 64-year-old retired lawyer and former assistant attorney general. The earliest alien experience Terry can recall was when he was eight years old. Incident at Devil's Den. In May of 1963, he saw a UFO and described it as a perfect silver disc. Three years later, on a clear night, he saw a second flying disc outside his second story bedroom window. Incident at Devil's Den. In 1975, while serving as a medic in the Air Force, he witnessed yet another UFO hovering 50 feet over an ICBM missile silo. Incident at Devil's Den. Two years later, while he and a friend were camped in an isolated state park known as Devil's Den, Terry had a life-changing fourth encounter. Not only did Terry and a friend witness an estimated five-story high UFO, but this fourth encounter would be an epic, life-altering event. Incident at Devil's Den by Terry Lovelace. Digital download or paperback now available on Amazon. We interrupt our scheduled programming to bring you the following conspiracy theory. Humpty Dumpty was pushed. WGOG DB John Tobin here. We are joined this week with our guest, Daniel Kloss. Daniel, thanks for being patient during the station break there. And we were talking about the Hinsdale House and how you first got involved in that. So we sort of uh, led up to a little bit you were talking about. Um, a friend of yours said you need to buy the house, and you were wondering how you were going to get it all done. And you've said that it's been quite a collaboration since since you took over the house. Now, what when you first thought about buying the house, what what were your, uh, you know, our, all along, what, what were your intentions for the house, and what did you hope to, to do by purchasing it? Um, I mean, I wanted to save it. I mean, it was it's a type of place that you can go to. Um, well, I mean, let's let's put it into perspective. So you're you're if you're a paranormal investigator, and you you go on these investigations, I mean, the chance of getting activity or any type of some some type of uh, spirit activity is very low. Uh, every now and then you get some some good things that happen that you can kind of show as a claim or something that you know you can say hey this is this is uh kind of unique that happened but uh the Hinsdale house something happens all the time you know every time i'm there and i don't know if it's just me but i look at the the book and i look at all the reviews from the teams and guests that have been there and stuff happens to people there all the time mm. and um it was that that really kind of drew me to the place and wanted me to keep it viable. I mean, it's, it's just like a, a, a hotbed of paranormal activity uh, for people to come and research. 
and it it's, it wasn't uh, wasn't like a selfish thing for me. It was more of like this is cool for me, so it's going to be cool for everybody that's in the field, and anybody and everyone that wants to come out to this place to check it out. And I've kind of made it like a, a goal to have anybody come there that wants to come there to investigate if you're interested in it you know how there's sometimes like holds on locations or there's high prices for teams to get in and it's it's all about it. it's like a money grab type of thing and uh, and i just didn't want that to be um happening at the hinsdale house um it's an awesome place and i want everybody to come to come there whether you have money or you don't have money if you have something to give to the field um i want you there and i want you to try to help try to it's it's, because it's like a big puzzle you know and and more and more we keep uncovering as as time goes uh of the history i mean we have a dated back to 1799 now and it's um you know it's an ongoing thing so if you can uncover one little piece of evidence that we can put into the puzzle i mean it it could help and and it has been helping And, and people have come out in droves to help put a roof on the place and paint or whatever. If I need stuff done, people people come out and do it. And I don't know if it's because of my approach to it um, or if, if they're drawn to it as well. I know that that might have a lot to do with it as well. But sure. um, I keep try to keep it like a family, you know, and there's no drama. No drama yeah, no. there at all. And, and that's a great thing. And you've done a nice job of representing the, the field and, and showing people – you know, uh, your approach as far as wanting to share and, and, and far more important to you to to share these experiences and to, to continue to learn. Because to, to your point, the more people that come out there and have different experiences that they can share with you and share with other people, the more you're going to learn about the history of the house and the more you can share uh, and, and kind of keep collecting that stuff. Because although you mentioned earlier that the Dandy family, we'll talk a little bit more about that, the most famous haunting certainly at, at the house. Um, you know, with a house that old, um, there could be all kinds of activity from, you know, uh, people who had been in the house, who'd passed in the house, people who just left their energy behind. So sure. it could be coming from, from just about anywhere. And also, you know, the groups of, uh, the large groups of investigators that come on, bringing a lot of energy there too. So you're getting energy from all, all over the place and, and, and driving, driving that around. And that certainly helped to stir up, I believe, you know, to stir up a lot of, uh, different things. So I'm sure you, you're hearing a lot of different things from different people. Um, I remember I went out there, I had the privilege to go out there in 2012 and, and host a meetup out there. And um, for me, it was like I didn't have one particular uh, profound experience, but I had this, and I, 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 I'm imagining this is, I'm not the only one who's had this, but I had this feeling that every room I went to, I was being watched or someone was following me or just kind of make, not like in an evil way, but more like a curiosity, like, what is everybody doing here kind of way? And I sort of just felt that energy sort of following me around the house. And there were other people that had some pretty, you know, great experiences that night. And uh, I, I just, uh, it stuck with me. And it's like, uh, it's one of those places that I'm sure um, I'll come back at some time soon. But, um, you know, it was, have you had that experience of just yeah feeling like you're being followed around the house? Yeah, inside and out. I mean, it's, it's uh, both. And it's yeah, all the time, you know, it's, you don't ever feel like you're alone there. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the feeling. I mean, there were a lot of people there, but I, I certainly could feel that energy. And it was like, OK, so I'm going to go, you know, upstairs. And then I felt like whatever that energy was, it's just just going with me. And it wasn't communicating with with me per- personally. But there were certainly other folks that, uh, that were having um, some pretty cool experiences in in, uh, in the house that night. So I can imagine that's one night. So uh, what what do you feel uh, in your opinion? What's the most profound or interesting thing that's happened to you and your experiences at the house? Well, right at the kind of at the beginning stages of me falling in love with the place, it was a a experience I had in the kitchen. Um, The electric was gone. There was no rhyme or reason for EMF spikes in the house at that time. The doors were left open and this place was actually getting ready to be torn down. And we were kind of saying goodbye to it, you know. And at that point, I had done some research and... um, learned about the Misnick family. I saw the videos on YouTube and I just for, for shits and giggles called out for Flo Misnick. And, um, all of a sudden I felt this tingly sensation up my arm and I had a K2 meter in my hand and the thing just started going a red solid in my hand. And I felt like I was continuing to have a conversation with her. I felt connected to her. And, um, I asked her if she would hold my hand as I went up the steps 
Now, I mean, you've investigated before. You know you set a K2 meter down, and you're lucky if you get a little bleep on it here and there, and then supposedly that's a spirit speaking with you, you know. But this thing stayed lit in my hand to the red, to the peak EMF, uh, all the way up the stairs, and I just felt like, you know, the, the goosebumps on my arms, and I have it all in video, too. I mean, mm. it's all uh, documented on video, and um, when we got to the master bedroom upstairs, I had said, we you know, follow me into the room, and when we went into uh, Mary's room, uh, I lost it and didn't get it back, and i just been, like, trying to get her. I do get her still, but it, not like that. I've never got it like that before, you know, again. Uh, so, but that kind of just started the started the research to the fact that okay, so there probably are other spirits here besides this dark demon or demonic spirit or evil spirit or whatever you want to call it that was there in the 1970s that was traumatizing the Dandy family. Mm. You know, it, it seemed like there was an array of different things and an array of different spirits in and out of there all the time, and you didn't know what day, whatever day you got there, what you were going to get. Mm. So it's it's kind of weird. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those of our listeners out there, Daniel, that are not uh, familiar with the Hinsdale House and the Dandy family events, can you give us like a brief overview of this? This you know, for our listeners, this house is one of, absolutely one of the most famous uh, locations in all of New York State uh, as being notoriously haunted. It's been on upteen shows and history shows as well as paranormal shows and different things. Can you give the listeners a brief history of that particular haunting since that's uh, the most well known? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so um, in 1969, the the property was purchased by the Reese family. Uh, it was 100 acres at the time, and uh, their their objective was obviously it was a financial investment. Um, they had purchased it from the McMahon O'Brien family. Um, they subpartialed the properties into about 10 acres each, and then we're going to sell the properties for hunting. You know, and kind of market to people in Buffalo. And this particular property had a barn and a and a house on it. So they tore the barn down and uh, they dug ponds on every um, piece, every property just to make them more appealing for people. And I feel like that may have unearthed something. And I feel like that may have, have a lot to do with what happens next. So this family, um, uh, that's like a leased uh, rent to own type uh, scenario that they had with uh, the Reese family and um, the dandy family, they thought it was their dream house and they were moving in from Buffalo and, uh, they moved into this house and all of a sudden started experiencing a lot of weird things in the house and outside of the house to the to the point where it was getting uh, things were being thrown, um, you know, scratching, um, tormenting. And um, she, the, the mother, Clara, um, had reached out to a priest at St. Bonaventure, Father Alphonse Trebolt, and he was kind of like a guide, a guiding them because he was very into the occult at that time. And, guys, this is all before um, The Exorcist came out. So this wasn't like a thing that people talked about, you know, back in the back in the 1970s, early 70s. And uh, so he was there trying to help them. He did a mass there, and it died down for a little bit. Then it came back full force again. And finally, um, they performed a sanctioned uh, structural exorcism in the house. And uh, that did not work either. And finally, he told the family, you know, my best advice to you is to leave. No, get out of here. This is the only thing I can tell you to keep your family safe. And then they, they vacated the premises. And many families came and went. And, uh, you know, we're documenting new ones all the time because it was a, a lease, a rent to own. It's not deeded, so it's hard to find the people that actually tried to live there. But people are coming out of the woodwork now that it's uh, popular. People are saying, I lived here from here, from this month to this month, three months here, six months. You know, it's like nobody wanted to live there. Um, the only ones that actually spent some time there were the Misnick family, and they were older, you know, and I don't think they were as susceptible to what was going on there because of their age. Um, so, so, so have other families that have lived there come out and said that they had, you know, uh, yes. experiences? They have. Yes, and that's why they left. There was one family that le- uh, left all their personal items there because they didn't want what was ever there to know that they were leaving. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I also have uh, knowledge of another exorcism that was performed there. Um, you know, somebody that got overtaken by what was there. There is a dark entity there. There's something darker there. I don't think it's a demon. I just think it's a bastard of a spirit. Um, but it's, uh, you know, if you let let anything into your mind, you know, if you if you let your guard down, things can yeah. happen. So, I mean, it's, you got you got to protect yourself when you do these things. 
Right, and, and I think that's important to note the folks that are thinking about coming out there. I agree with Daniel. I've only been there once, so he knows a lot more about it, sort of way a lot more about it than I do. But I agree. I don't think whatever's there is demonic, but there, uh, whatever presence is there, there is something dark. And there is also, I, 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 from experiences from people who have told me, there's probably some light energy there, too. Do you think? Have you had experiences I, with that? 100%. There, I mean, there's so many different theories and, and different things that we've caught that are unexplainable. That I have, I can't even pinpoint you know, to even right. fathom what it might be. So it's per, definitely perhaps. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, just for people, it's 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 safe. There are people there. Uh, we haven't had any reports of you know people being injured or anything like that. No. It's always a, con- a concern with people when they hear about when they hear the word exorcism. They hear dark past. You know, um, I wouldn't go there and antagonize the energy, and I would certainly wouldn't go there and provoke it, but. Um, I think that uh, you'd be safe, and, and there's certainly people that have had lots of experience that are there. So if you're thinking about going, uh, before I forget, why don't we um, give uh, give the listeners in, uh, where they can find out the information as far as getting uh, merchandise about the Hinsdale House, as far as purchasing copies of your book, and as far as you know, uh, getting information about how, how they can come out and, and research there as well. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the easiest way is I tried to, like, centralize everything. Just go to my website, danielclass.com, and uh, there's links for Wildwood. There's links for uh, Hinsdale. There's links for merchandise and upcoming events that I'm going to be at and ticket sales for those as well. Excellent. I just want to make sure we got that in. I'll probably uh, probably remember again later, but just to make sure I didn't forget. So, uh, so, so you've been involved in the paranormal world now for quite a while. You've been doing uh, work with the Hinsdale House. You've also been doing some work um, – uh, with Nick Groff and his show came out, Paranormal Lockdown came out to the Hinsdale House. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about the experiences that Nick and his team had when they were at the house, for those who didn't see the show yet. Yeah, I mean, I was I was there. I mean, it was kind of like just crazy for me to to think, you know, okay, I got this email uh, and, this, and the person that reached out to me was Nick's cousin. And um, it, it really was – they knew more about the house than I did at that point, so I was really enthralled. Because, you know, you get people that send these emails saying, oh, I, I do a show, and can I get the place for free? And they try to, like, bamboozle you or whatever, <laughs> you know. But um, I got this email, and because of the knowledge, the vast knowledge that they had and the research that they have done already, I really wanted to find out more and talk to this guy. And then they wanted to come and film their show there that wasn't on TV yet. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a chance on this. You know, let me let me take a chance on this there. They're offering uh, some money, and we really need to put this towards the roof, and and just all kind of fit, fit in well at that point, you know. And um, then I got the contract in the mail, and it was Groff Entertainment, and I was like, "Are you kidding me? This is one. Of, <laughs> this is like one of the big guys, you know. Like, yeah. okay, he's uh he's coming to my house, so this this is awesome. So I knew this was going to be good. And um, he was. They spent there for three days and four or four days and three nights. And, you know, I, I just watched as he worked and Katrina worked and it's, it's bunch, it's not as it's, it's, I know it's summed up into an hour TV show, but they worked the whole time they were there. He was tired. He put it, put everything into it that he had. He really wanted to push the field and he really wanted to, you know, because everybody was, it was like kind of a stalemate, you know, like all the shows were doing the same thing and then, and, and everybody had the same equipment. Everybody could get the equipment. So he was pushing it with new, new equipment, you know, trying to do like uh, new spirit boxes and, and, and just different things that nobody's ever seen before that new inventors were coming out with to experiment with. And um, I really, I really thought it was awesome um, what he was doing. So, and I really have a lot of respect for him and uh, you know, I would stick up for him you know, there's a lot of people that say some stuff, you know, about how he investigates and, and he doesn't take it seriously. And it's just a TV show. But I, I was there for two filmings. You know, I was there for Statler because I was involved with that one. And I was there for the Insdale House. And I know how he works. He takes yeah. it very seriously. And, um, you know, he had a personal experience there as well mm-hmm. um, where he felt like what this dark entity that is there followed him. And he let it into his head. And he was that was his that was his goal, though. You know, he knew what he was doing and he let right. his guard down and. Um, followed it. It followed him home, and it's uh, it's funny because when he left, we were getting a lot of EVPs saying, "Where's Nick? Where's Nick?" <laughs> you know, it was uh, it, it was just weird um, that he was getting called out, and I I know I sent a bunch of them over to him as well. I always found it really fascinating when when spirit um, connects on a personal level like that by name, and I've had a few locations out here. One in particular that 
was kind of my stomping ground or a training area or whatever you want to call it. it didn't own the place, but had the keys to it. it. Would go there, you know, a lot. And um, you know, they would know my first and last name, and I would say hello, and I'd get the name over, you know, things like that. So uh, it, it's really cool when you make start making that connection. And then you can start sort of uh, putting some pieces of the puzzle together. I'm imagining you've been there enough times now. Where have you had experiences where you've you've hired uh, your name on recording? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. They know who I am. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm imagining that you know one of the cool things that I, I think you're doing. Uh, and let's, I want to talk a little bit no, uh, now about the uh, the restoration project that you're doing. So uh, restoring the house now that you see the house is about. 200 years old ish in that, yes. that time frame. Um, but we're restoring our, not we're, I had nothing to do with it. You're restoring it. The folks that are helping you are restoring it to its 1970, early 1970s era where it's most known or, you know, where it's right. most remembered from. What was the uh, reasoning behind that? And um, how far along in the restoration are you at this point? Um, we're, we're getting, I mean, the house is pretty, is the house is stable. Um, we have a complete new roof on both sections of the house. Um, the septic had to be all done, redone. Uh, we had to get a new well pump put in to get water pumping back to the house. And um, and being able to use the bathroom and running water and using a toilet. So we had to have all that done. Um, and it, it's quite expensive. We had to remove a beehive of 500,000 honeybees out of the floorboard of Mary's room. Um, and you know, I didn't kill those bees just so everybody knows I had them removed <laughs> and brought, there's haunted Hinsdale honey, you know, at a farm down the road now, <laughs> of but, course um, there is. <laughs> it was, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, I couldn't kill them. I mean, those, I, the, you know, all these stories about bees nowadays, you know, you don't want to, yeah. so we had those removed peacefully as peaceful as we could. And it was unbelievable. It was honeycomb about four foot into the floor. Those bees have been there for a long time. And Clara talks about them in her book in, from the, imagine, in the 19th century. Can you imagine the things that they've seen and heard? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, the funny thing is, is this room, Mary's room, this is where in the in the show the flies are and all the bugs are drawn to this room. And this is the room where all the bees were, too, underneath the floorboards, you know, 500,000 of them. So it's a uh, coincidence. I don't know, but it's uh, – pretty neat and we've gotten the internet installed there because there's no way to communicate with the outside world when you're up there which is an extra creep factor yeah and um so we we did get, have the only way i could get internet is through satellite so we have satellite internet so you can and we have these little mini towers for verizon and um so people can actually communicate and go live and and that was one of my goals is to actually get it shown to the outside world so people could actually see it. So now we can actually stream with cameras online and things like that. Right. Um, and other teams that go there so they can go live as well. Um, but we're, we're, I'd say with the house, we're probably about like 75% there. Mm -hmm. uh, we still got to do some work in the basement with the, with the bricks. And uh, we got to finish the kitchen ceiling and we got to finish up the bathroom. We did re remodeled the bathroom to, to, to usability at least. And, um, and that's about it. And we'll we'll get some new windows put in, and that that'll be it with the house as far as what I want to do to uh, fix it up. Um, the next step I want to do is build a, another structure uh, on the opposite side of the um, driveway. What will act as a base camp for teams that are coming mm -hmm. in. So we really cater to teams that are coming in. Uh, there'll be uh, sleeping quarters there and connection to the house. So it'll just help with the element so it's not uh there's not that much contamination with teams when they come in to do the investigation so they'll actually be able to go to into a static location and be able to be inside the house watching what's going on and also part of that will be a museum where we're going to actually showcase some of the items from the 1970s uh i have some of the uh i've been bestowed some of the things that were used during the exorcism and some of the items that were in the house and i have a lot of paperwork and documentation from clara uh, dandy and uh, you know an account of the exorcism that happened written da written down from her and just some really cool stuff that I want to display and be able to show everybody. It's not easy for me to just leave it out, knowing thinking that hands can't take will walk away with it. And it's a one 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 in a lifetime piece. So, right, right. Um, but these are things that I'll have copies of and I'm going to place it out there for everybody to see, so they'll have the knowledge as well when they I, I come did. to the house. I just I just love that you're doing that. I mean, I love historical preservation and to, to preserve it to that level and have that uh, ability to share that information and share those things with people is just uh, you know just just fantastic. So thank you for doing that. Um, have, are there any members of the Dandy family still still living? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, unfortunately, um, 
Phil just died. He was in a car accident. Mm. Um, you know, he just died recently. Uh, Clara is still alive, and I've communicated with her on many occasions. Yeah. She's, um, you know, she's she feels um, done with it. You know, she I think she's been screwed over many times <laughs> right. with, that, with that place, um, and um, I'm just I'm I'm trying to make it right with her, and I'm and I'm hoping with some a future project that we have going on, it'll benefit her. And uh, she's she's in Oregon. She's an older lady. I know there, she needs she needs money, and it's her story. You know, it's not my right. story. Yeah, it'd and, be fascinating. Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say. So hopefully, I, hopefully I, we have something planned in the future that's going to give back to her for her story. You know, this is her story. Echoes of a haunting. She wrote it, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that that works out for her. And it's oh. a, a kind of reinvent. You know, all the bad things that have happened to her because of this. All right, we are on our last station break. We'll be back in just a minute here. And uh, thanks for listening to Keeping the Spirits Alive. We'll be right back with you with Daniel Class. Shopping, dining, beautiful lakes and rivers, and a monster? Welcome to Braxton County, West Virginia. Centrally located, Braxton County, West Virginia is the ideal place to visit. Natural beauty and recreation abound with two beautiful lakes for easy kayaking and canoeing and many hiking trails. Did we mention the Flatwoods Monster? That's right. Visit Braxton County, West Virginia's Flatwoods Monster Museum. And not only learn about the Flatwoods Monster, but walk in the same footsteps as the people who witnessed it. Nearly all of our attractions can be found within a few miles of Interstate 79. Visit us online at BraxtonWV.org. That's BraxtonWV.org. Braxton County, West Virginia. Center yourself here. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has delivered a -a one-of-a-kind reading experience, covering everything from psychics, UFOs, paranormal investigations, and more. To subscribe, visit fatemag.com or call 828-702-3032. That's 828-702-3032. Subscribe and find your true reports of the strange and unknown at fatemag.com. Here again, we're talking Hintedale House with Daniel Class. And Dan, yeah, just before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the Dandy family. And, and uh, I, I, I was going to say that I really think it would be uh, fascinating to, if, to have uh, uh, any member of the family really come back to the house. Um, he talked about maybe something in the future. Would that even be consideration for them? Would they be willing to maybe even consider coming back to the house after what happened to them? I don't think so. But mm-hmm. I think that they may consider doing an interview. Right. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to at least see that she's older now, and um, I think she's her feet are in Oregon, so that's where right. I probably have to go to speak with her about it. Um, it would be great, great to get like a, maybe a live Skype feed or something like that uh, yeah. to, to, to kind of well, talk about I her know, story. I know she watches. She she keeps an eye out because <laughs> there's been times where there's been teams there that are live, and she'll she'll send me a message and say, "I'd appreciate it if they'd say this." All right, <laughs> you know. I, so she she keeps me on my toes if uh, if if something's out of line or we're we're not saying something the right way. And I you know I want I want it to be said the right way. And I know there's a lot of you know where you sit at a campfire and somebody says something and it gets passed around, and by the time it gets to the li- next person or the last person, it's completely wrong. You know. So I try to keep. You know, I go into these events and talking to people about the place and trying to get the history as proper as we can so everybody's on the same page with it, you know. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great way to be. And I think it's great that you have that connection or you have some connection with her to to um, to have that perspective or to add that or even offer that perspective to folks while they're there. That's really a cool thing um, that she's still has an interest after all these years, you know, of what's going on there and, and feels that connection. That, that should go a long way to people who – come out to the house and know that, you know, even though these people had these, you know, terrifying experiences, 
they still have a connection there, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, she's always said she loved it. It was she's mm. her dream house, you know. And I mean, yeah. I, I can see that. I mean, standing outside in the middle of the night, staring at the sky. I mean, it's it's picturesque and beautiful there, it, you know. It absolutely is. Um, I definitely recommend folks reaching out to you if they have an interest in paranormal teams, researchers. Uh, it's certainly a, a, a remarkable location, and uh, definitely go to uh, Daniel Class K L A E S dot com uh, to get more information on that. Daniel, you know, let's talk for a moment, if you don't mind, about some of the other things you're involved in. Um, you have an involvement with the uh, the Wildwood Sanitarium. Um, tell the listeners a little bit about that location and, and what is your involvement there. Um, so basically, my friend uh, Lori Ann Wagatha, she's um, she was a regular at some of some of the ghost hunts I facilitated at different locations, and uh, um, just became a good friend. And uh, I remember we were having our my 40th birthday party, and she. Uh, came to the surprise party. She was in on it, and uh, her and her husband came, and her daughter. And she said, "Dan, could you talk? Could I talk to you for a second? And I uh, pulled me in the back room, and she told me she goes, "There's a sanitarium out in Salamanca, and I'm just, I love it to death, and I think I'm going to buy it." And uh, she was asking me about what I do and how how can we make it viable and um, try to restore it, you know, and um, and kind of recreate what I'm doing at Hinsdale House at the Wildwood Sanitarium. And uh, I've just been, you know helping you know I, I help with all the bookings um i actually i book the whole place so um what i've been doing is co-marketing it um with the hinsdale house hey you're a team you want to come to hinsdale house why don't you spend the weekend in cataraugus county and do two locations you know and it's the same price and uh you know it's just fair it needs it needs a lot of work to it as well but it's got a lot of history and um i've had a lot of things happen to me there as well i mean i wouldn't say it's as busy as the hinsdale house but it definitely has its uh um spirits there it definitely has some residual stuff happening and i I believe that there's some other spirits there as well um it's also going to be featured on paranormal lockdown season three when that airs coming up soon so we're excited about that um that'll help draw some attention to it as well um that they came so it's i'm excited for it and it's 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 getting busier and um i just i want Lori to be able to do what she wants she has such a vision to to bring uh um, a metaphysical community together as well, and I think that it'll happen. And she's on the right path, and she's doing well. She she invested her whole life savings into it. So, wow, that's great. I mean, I, anytime I hear more about folks just really committed to the historical preservation and to uh, really open to and wanting paranormal research to further, you know, what we can all learn from all of this is just just great. So, you know, uh, again, thanks to her, but also thank you for your involvement there. Uh, there as well. And you've been doing a lot of uh, work with uh, creepy people in uh, your, your management company, those folks, and, and Nick Groff, and doing some of his event work as well. What else, tell, let the folks know about some of the other things that you're involved in. Is- well, I mean, I, I they, they offered me to do um, a, a show on their network, Elizabeth St. Nick Groff on VD Space, and um, we're, we've done five episodes so far. We're focusing on our Western New York community right now and doing some local spots. We just did Statler this past week and we have a bunch of cool locations lined up locally that we're going to be able to highlight on the network for people. So I'm really excited about that. And, um, we've been to New Jersey, um, Philadelphia, uh, the, uh, you know, Salem Mansion, the Murdoch Whitney Mansion, the mm-hmm. Selma Mansion, I mean, the Ducray School. I mean, just so many really cool places. I, I just love the fact that I'm, I'm able to get into these places and investigate where I normally wouldn't have been able to. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, a ghost hunt on speed because we only have an hour <laughs> and we have to do it live. But it's unique in an aspect where people are actually getting to see what we do live. Sure. Um, th- those, you know, that see the one hour shows. Um, you know, that's that that might be three or four days edited into an hour and you just get the best. This is us, me, three of my friends doing what we do, cramming it into an hour and hopefully something happens or at least you're going to get some good history on the location and ch- really get to check it out. And it, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far being able to do that and feature some of these um, locations that we've been at. Wow, that's great. So, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for being our guest this week on Keep Our, like, there's more than one of me, my <laughs> guest this week on Keeping the Spirits Alive. Uh, it's great to get to talk to you, and I, I very much look forward to seeing you soon, and, and hopefully I'll make it out to the house here one of these days, and, and we'll to, uh, you know, that'd be fantastic as well. So, thank you so much again. That's Daniel Class, K-L-E, K-L-A-E-S dot com. 
uh, for information on, on how you can uh, book the Hinsdale House for your team or Wildwood Sanitarium, certainly uh, check out Daniel's book, Hinsdale House, an American Haunting, which is available at Amazon and many other fine retailers. Uh, Dan, thanks so much, and uh, we'll talk to you very much. Uh, uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. All right. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a great night now. Thank have you. Have a good night. All right, listeners, we'll see you again soon on Keeping the Spirits Alive. Until then, take care and keep the hauntings alive. <laughs>